and aloha! Welcome to the Blue Note Fan Report. I'm Guy, the Hawaii Blues fan, and I'm your host on the only program that is by a fan for the fan and absolutely about you, the fan. Now, a lot of times you've heard me call the guys that played for the Blues and wore the Blue Note my hockey heroes. But today's guest, a different type of hero. I'm wearing my military jersey, and it's so appropriate today with my military hat. But I do have to apologize to my guests. First of all, my hair is out of regulation. So is my facial hair. But um, Brock, this is a good one. Can't wait. Oh, I know. So please, everyone, give a huge, huge Blue Note fan report welcome to former Blues goalie and retired Canadian Forces Lieutenant Colonel Ed Danowski. Ed, welcome to the Blue Note Fan Report. So great to hey, have you Hey, great to be with you. Great oh, to be with you, Guy. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Before we get going, I want to I want to bring this up, and uh, I, I know that your family is, is 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 mourning a little bit. You lost your oldest daughter about a month ago, uh, very suddenly, and everyone here at the STL Fan Report and and at uh, the Blue Note fan report really want to send our condolences to you and thank you for doing this in this time of. Well, Gabe and Brock, thank you very much. And yes, we, we, uh, the family took a hit with the sudden passing of my oldest daughter, Amy, uh, on uh, the 6th of March. And, and, uh, she, uh, it was a medical condition that took her very suddenly. It was an undetected medical condition and it happened while she was uh, in the midst of a very hard workout preparing for an international competition where she was going to be representing Canada. And, um, and it was sudden and it was a great loss, but, but as a family, uh, we're very strong with, with the knowledge, with the hope and the assurance that uh, our separation is, is short uh, and we will be together again. Yes. Um, we, 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 we know how that, and we'll, we'll talk more about that a little bit later, but first let's do my favorite question. And where did you grow up and how did you get into hockey? Well, I, I was uh, uh, born and raised in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. Actually, I was born in Regina, but I grew up in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan and uh, out on the prairies of Western Canada, the wheat fields. And we played a lot of hockey in the outdoors doors uh, as, as a boy and, and on outdoor rinks and pond hockey. And uh, I was very fortunate in that uh, I had an older brother, three years older than me, that uh, he was tasked by my parents to take me when he went to play hockey. So I was always playing with players that were three years older than me. And um, it was a challenge to skate with them. So uh, what they did is they said, here, you stand here between these two rubber boots, which are known as a goalie net up there, and um, stop anything that comes your way. And um, that's how it kind of got started for me. And it snowballed. I, I uh, played my minor hockey against. So always, it seemed like I was always playing in a league that was one level higher than I, my ability, but it, it, it dragged me up to a higher level. And uh, very fortunate uh, to have some success through minor hockey and was noticed by a junior team in Canada, the Regina Pats. And um, I'd remiss if I didn't say the oldest junior franchise in the world. It's, uh, it's over 100 years old, and, and that franchise, very storied and named after a, a military uh, uh, regiment in Canada, the, the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry. And um, anyways, I uh, played for that hockey team for four years, junior hockey, and and we, are, we had a very talented team there, a lot of very good players uh, that, who went on and played in the National Hockey League. Clark Gillies, Greg Jolly, Dennis Sobchak, uh, you know, a couple of the players went on to coach and uh, ran up to the National Hockey League level. Robbie Laird coached in Washington, and he's one of the head scouts for the Los Angeles Kings now. So there was a lot of talent and a lot of people that made a career out of hockey. I think 13 of the players on that team ended up playing professional at some level after so I was fortunate to be the goalie for that team. I, I, um, I could make a mistake and they could cover for me more times than not. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I've, I've interviewed a, a bunch of goalies here really, really, like in the last year or so. Um, one of them being your uh, partner on the 1980-81 Blues, uh, Mike Liu. You guys are definitely, definitely a, a, a different breed. I'll say that. So you're playing with kids three years older than you throwing pucks at you and you probably had no pads on. It was, <laughs> probably, <right. laughs> it was probably below zero. That puck had to feel like, uh, uh, I mean, I had to feel like a stone hitting you. 
That's very true, Gig. Very true. It um, it was very cold out there. I remember, and and um, you know, people think you're making it up, but again, my first set of pads were catalogs from Sears that were basically rolled up and being and held on with sealer rings. Um, and, and, you know, that's how the game got started for us back then. And, and, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. I remember it was, uh, it was extremely cold out there and, and you're right. I, I remember getting hit by pucks. that felt like stones. <laughs> they might've well, we, been stones. <laughs> <laughs> they yeah, could have been too. We, uh, we recently had Gary Unger on and he kind of talked about growing up playing pond hockey. And he said that there were just, you know, it'd be like 60 guys on the ice and you really had to learn how to handle the puck or else you wouldn't touch the puck. I imagine from a goalie standpoint, you're always facing shots. No matter, every time you turn around, there was some hot shot trying to shoot on you. That had to be a pretty it, good experience. Very true. Very true. Uh, uh, very true. Very true, Brock. It was it was a melee out there. It sometimes it looked more like a Donnybrook than a hockey game. And you're right, um, we didn't play with uh, with six on six. If there was twenty guys there, you'd have ten on ten. And if there were thirty guys there, it was fifteen on fifteen. And it was it was shinny. It was shinny, and um, it was a lot of fun. And your basic hockey skills uh, really developed. And I played hockey with a lot of good. Uh, young players who, who could shinny and they went on and had very successful careers up to the junior level and many of them beyond. Yeah. It's, it's I, I, I sit there in awe at, at your, your early childhood, you know, being out till the, the lights go down if there were no lights until the sun goes down and you didn't have a lot of sun back then. I mean, cause you're up further North. So you maybe got what sun went down at five o'clock in the afternoon. You guys probably played even, farther than that but to take it to that next level like you did it, it's really incredible so you got drafted by the blues in 1975 and normally most guys that get drafted they spend a year or two in the minors or, or on a, a junior team because the draft was when you were still in juniors you actually played your first the year you were drafted well i i, I was very fortunate uh, leo boyvin uh, was coach uh, when I came up and, and um, Leo lives just down the road from me now, actually not too far uh, from where I am in Southern Ontario right now. And Leo, um, he, he gave me a break and he started me, uh, he started me uh, a number of times uh, from Christmas on. And then of course uh, allowed me to, to uh, start the playoffs that year against Buffalo Sabres. And that was pretty exciting. But uh, the team in St. Louis, uh, there was a lot of moving parts there. There was a lot of talent. You know, again, the Gary Unger's name was mentioned. And, and you know, we had Bobby and Barkley Plager. And, of course, uh, you know, just two icons there in, in, um, in St. Louis. And I was very fortunate. Glenn Hall was my goaltending coach there. And, of course, um, Glenn, who's another native of Saskatchewan, I mean, he did it all, as far as I'm concerned, uh, in the game and, and just a quality character and uh, amount of character and, and strength and insight. Um, he helped me so much with my mental preparation for the game. Had it not been for Glenn, um, you know, you come out of junior, we win a Canadian championship with junior and you think you're pretty good and you think you know how to handle pressure, but it was Glenn who really put me on the right track and said, yeah, you know, it's all just about stealing the puck. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know if, um, I don't know if it would have been, uh, if I would have got to where I was, had it not been for, again, Leo taking a chance, Glenn Hall being there behind me. And the other goalie uh, with the team was Eddie Johnson, again, a veteran who really knew how to, uh, how to get you focused on what was important. Well, uh, yeah, the, the Blues actually – oh, go ahead, Brock, go. I, I just want to ask, you know, how was difficult back then was it for a young goalie – to break in, to, to break in, because you're dealing with some legendary guys who were in the Maple Leaf systems, guys who've been there for years, you know, Gump Worsley, Till Blake, and all of a sudden you guys are coming up. How how were you guys received? Was it kind of get these young kids out of here, or were they do they welcome you? Well, again, uh, uh, Eddie Johnson, Yves Belanger and Eddie Johnson were the two goalies with the Blues when I got there, and it, it ended up being Eddie Johnson and myself who, who were um, the two in the team. And, you know, a finer gentleman you'll never meet than, than, than Eddie. Um, you know, you genuinely felt and knew that, that Eddie wanted you to play and play well when you played. You know, um, you know he had done it all in the game uh, with Boston who had won the Stanley Cup and, 
And he's, again, just a, a, a quality individual. And, you know, if, if, if a person is going to uh, craft your character or build character, um, I certainly had the models in St. Louis to do that in Glen Hall and, and, um, and Eddie Johnson that first year. And, and, and it, was, uh, it was really uplifting and it was fun. And the, the team was good. It was solid. We were young. We had some great players, Larry Patey and Chuck Lefley and, you know, Bruce Affleck. And I, you just go down the whole list of the Plaguers. Um, and they, they all welcomed me as a young player, Red Berenson. Um, you know, and, and uh, I remember my first game was in Maple Leaf Gardens, Saturday night, hockey night in Canada, uh, December of, of 1975. And, and I can be, I remember it like it was yesterday, sitting in the dressing room in that iconic uh, uh, Toronto Maple Leaf Gardens. And, um, you know, and I can remember the absolute, I think fear would be, you know, and stress, knowing that you're going to go out there and play uh, on national television in Canada and everybody's going to be watching you and you want to do well, of course. And the, my teammates just helped me get right into it. EJ was there to, 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 you know, get me focused. And we did not win that game. But, uh, but it was so exciting, and I remember it like it was yesterday, a, a big, big marker for a young, a young goaltender to come up. And, and uh, Gay, you're right. There's, uh, there's a lot of uh, young players who, who take, it takes them a while to break into the game. And I don't think it's necessarily because they don't have the skill. Uh, there's certainly things you have to learn about on the ice, but it's the mental game you have to get a grip on. Yeah, and especially for a goaltender. Um, we, we've seen that in, in Blues history throughout and throughout. So let me ask you that a little bit. How did you get that forget it mentality? I mean, what, what brought up that, that mentality that you end up having that, you know, first of all, you're playing with guys three years older than you for the longest part of your time you said that you were, you know, always playing with guys older than you up here is where a goalie's skill is you no, know, not here. But how do you keep that thought process of, you know, how to stop the next one? Well, it, it's funny you should say that uh, or to ask that question. Yeah, it's a, and that's a great question. Um, there's, a, there's a skill that I think most successful goaltenders learn. And, and I know you said you've interviewed some great ones uh, uh, here on, on, the, on the show, um, you know. And um, I think they'd all say the one thing in common is, um, it's, it's a skill that you have to focus on what you have control over. You can't focus on the things you don't have control over. And I would offer that that's a life skill too. Uh, we can all take something away from that. Um, in life, there's just too many things we don't have control over. But if you find out the things that you do and you focus on that, um, you, you're going to be more successful than not. And for a goaltender, it's, it's number one preparation. You know, what you do to prepare for a game, um, you know, uh, the training that you do, the visualization, the diet, the exercise, um, the study of the players that, you're, that are on the other team. All of that's done before the game, obviously. And then when the game starts, the training kicks in, for lack of a better term. And as a, as a former service member yourself and having served in the Navy and been at sea and been, in, been on operations – you can identify that that's, that's something that resonates with every uh, soldier, sailor, airman, and woman, a coast guardman, and, and woman out there. Uh, you focus on what you have control over. You're part of a bigger team. Uh, more times than not, you're part of events that are much, much bigger than yourself. And the game, and that's how I felt in Toronto in that game, in the, that first game for me in Maple Leaf Gardens. I sat there realizing, Ed, you're part of something that's much, much bigger than yourself. You better focus on what you have control over. And when you do make a mistake or when the other team scores a good goal on you or sometimes a bad goal, um, you know, you have to focus on what's coming next. You, you, you will learn from your mistake or you will learn from what happened. And certainly as a goaltender, you get plenty of opportunities. They look at those game films, uh, slow motion, reverse angle, and, you know, eight or nine or ten times. And everybody's got an opinion. So you get a chance to do that. But during the game, you got to focus on what's coming next. Um, and, and, uh, I tended not never to take the puck out of the net once it was behind me. That was a referee's job. Let them do that. Um, uh, I was starting to focus already back at center ice and where that next shot was coming from. Wow. I mean, you know what? You're not the only one that said that, uh, Grant Fuhr said something very similar to that. Um, and Mike Liu, absolutely. He said that that wasn't my job. 
skated away, turned around, come back, and got ready for the next one. So, yeah, yeah that's, that's a great point. Yeah. Speaking, of, speaking of Mike, I would like to offer, you know, I was fortunate uh, to be part of that 1981 team, that 80-81 uh, team, that, that Mike was the, uh, the backstop, the anchor, um, too. I mean, we had great players, uh, Sutter and, and Federico and, and Babich and, you know, others that, uh, that, that were there. But, um, um, you know, Mike probably was the best goaltender in the game of hockey at that time for that year. And it was a privilege to play with Mike. And, and, and um, I didn't play a lot of hockey that, that year, but I had no problem, um, uh, you know, behind Mike because he was just so strong and so focused. And, uh, you know, he, took the, he picked up the whole team and took them to another level. I don't think I ever saw a goaltender work harder in practice than Mike Leute. Uh I have great, great respect for the man. It was good to catch up with him a couple of years ago in St. Louis for that, for that outdoor classic. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, that um, told me about that. Oh, go ahead, Brock. We'll we'll get back to I'm that. Sorry, I just you know I want to ask you how obviously with you know the passing of Bobby Plager, we're starting to get a lot of stories from alumni and guys are starting to kind of show up again. And and obviously post COVID, we're starting to get a lot of a lot of uh, stories about these guys. You know, who are some of the people that you're still connected with, whether the Blues or whether through the NHL? that just became lifelong friends and guys that you mentioned a couple of them, but there are still guys that you, you still really admire and, and keep in contact with. Well, on a very personal level, uh, Larry Patey and, and Bruce Affleck are two of my closest friends down there in, in St. Louis, Gary Unger and I keep, uh, uh, keep in contact. Gary's out, out West now in the States. The challenge right now, of course, with the COVID, the border being closed is to travel back and forth, but I make two or three trips to St. Louis a year on a, without the COVID uh, 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 pandemic lockdown. <laughs> but, um, you know, the, the, the Blues organization, the Blues fans, the Blues alumni in St. Louis, um, the staff, uh, I mean, they set the, they set the mark for, for how um, uh, alumni should be treated and how um, – how you're you're respected and 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 you're allowed to still be part of the organization you know when the when the when the team won the stanley cup there a couple of years ago um i don't think there was anybody who ever wore the blue jersey that didn't feel that they were a part of that i was on the other side of the atlantic ocean i was living in europe at the time and and uh i couldn't have been any closer to the team that team that won the cup um, then, then having been, if I'd been there, I wouldn't have felt any, any more joy or, or, um, associations in there. And, and, and on another note, you know, uh, the fans in St. Louis, um, are, are the best fans you, you could ever hope for anywhere. Um, you know, again, I, I, I spent my time with different teams in the minors and I played for three NHL teams. The fans in St. Louis, uh, are, are second to none. Wonderful people great followers of the game, knowledgeable of the game. And um, I just love going back to St. Louis, linking up with uh, Larry Patey and Bruce Affleck and the other alumni down there and doing things in the city. It's, 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 it's very, very special to me. Yeah. Um, I've talked to both Bruce Affleck. I've interviewed him. I'm interviewing Larry Patey here very soon. Both great, great guys. Really. Um, in fact, I haven't talked to one former player that really didn't say what you just said. They echo it. And uh, when it comes to an alumni group, I got to think that the Blues alumni group, probably one of the closest knit and tightest groups of any of, especially the U.S. teams, and maybe most of the Canadian teams, I would think maybe Montreal and Toronto's groups might be a little tighter knit, but I'm sure you guys come really, really close. Well, I've, I've heard from from uh, alumni members of the Toronto Maple Leafs because they're just down the road. And, and we, we do various things together, uh, golf tournaments and stuff like that. Again, pre COVID. Um, and we do things with the Montreal uh, alumni and Ottawa senators, Winnipeg Jets alumni. Uh, and they all speak of St. Louis and the great things that are done in St. Louis by the alumni and by the staff and by the team in support of the alumni um, you know, it's, it's, there's no question that the, the St. Louis Blues alumni uh, have set the mark, set the benchmark pretty high. Well, when you're, when you're talking about that and you're talking about Mr. Plager, I have to show this. I got this yesterday. This is Mike special? Hoffman's Bobby Plager jersey that he wore in honor of Bobby on the uh, 
Saturday after he passed in St. Right. Louis at that game. Right. Um, this is going to be my signature jersey, the jersey that when I get to meet you, there's a spot on here for you somewhere. So, well, save me, a, save me a place on it there. That, that number five, I can remember being in that, looking up and seeing uh, both uh, Bobby and Barkley's uh, numbers at time. Uh, what a privilege it was to be in the net when Bobby and Barkley were, uh, were on the ice. And uh, I'm one of the few players that can say that I was in a game where Bobby, Barkley, and Billy were all on the ice at oh, the yeah. same time. The whole yeah. family. And, and uh, classy guys, wonderful, wonderful people. And, and uh, to their families, um, you know, again, my condolences in, in, uh, for Bobby's passing and, and to Alan and, uh, you know, all of the plaguers that are in St. Louis, it's just a, you're all dear to my heart. Yeah. I got to ask you about the hip check because he's known about that <laughs> hip check. And you, you, you saw, you've seen it. You're on the ice. That would be a lethal, a lethal hip check. What, what, what can you tell us about it? Well, you, you'd, you'd see especially the odd young player uh, that were just breaking into the league would hit the blue line and, and you know, they'd get fancy uh, with the puck. And of course, neither Bobby or Barkley were dazzled by the stick work. They were looking at they were looking that opposition, that young opposition player, right in the center of his crest. And you know where the puck was going didn't matter. As soon as they got him on the outside, the player to try and break around the outside, out would come that hip. And I saw that more times than I can count. And what you would see was the hip check, and then two skates going through the air as they did a cartwheel. And if they were lucky, they landed on the ice and they got up and skated uh, skated off. There were times where they didn't skate off, <laughs> but uh, both both Bobby and Barkley had mastered the hip check. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely right, Brock. <laughs> it was a beautiful thing to see when you're the goaltender <laughs> behind them. <laughs> well, you bring up something really interesting, and that's what you don't see in today's game with a lot of defensemen. You see him playing the puck and not the body. And, and Bobby always talked about right here. That's all yeah. I saw. I saw I Bobby's quote was, "I saw his boobs." And his belly. And yep. that's all I look for. Yeah, yeah. And he talked about that. And, and, and he used to work with the young defensemen um, when they joined the team. And, and uh, he'd stay out and work with them, both Bobby and Bark. And, of course, both of them coached, too, in the Blues organization, as you know. And, um, and they were great at developing young defensemen and, and talking to them and passing on things just like that. You know, how to, how to move the puck up the boards, how to pick the puck up uh, behind the net. And, and uh, you know, and move it out uh, out of your own zone. And, uh, you know, and they played with so much passion. You know, they really did. Uh, uh, I remember one night, uh, you know, I can say it now, and, and uh, I know Barkley's looking down and he'll chuckle at this one. We were playing in Kansas City against the Scout. And, um, and uh, Will Paymont uh, hit the blue line and he let a shot go past uh, Barkley's ankle. And I was screened on it. I didn't, and I didn't move. And I, the puck went by me on low on the stick side and I didn't move. It was a goal. And, and Bark turned around and he looked at me as if you should have had that. And all I did is just, I, you know, I just shrugged my shoulders and I said, Bark, I didn't see it. And Bark got really, really agitated. And he skated up to me and he said, don't you ever stop and look at me and and point at me like that again. He said, Jacques Plant used to do that to me all the time. And everybody in the rink knew whose fault it was. He said, so don't you do that to me. <laughs> <laughs> so I only did it once to Barkley. I never, never again shrugged my shoulders, kind of looked at him and like to let everybody know it was his fault, not mine. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> God, you mind? I want to jump in. More. So you, know, you talked about Bobby Plager and Barkley Plager and this, you know, the, the whole reputation of them being like real tough guys, but I'll tell you, they were strategy. They were very good at the strategy of hockey. They understood the game. And I, I think sometimes those guys don't get credit. They get more credit for being fighters or bruisers than, than real strategy, strategy driven sort of players. Who are some players you think were just, just ma maestros out there that you really enjoyed watching play either for or against? Well, there was, there was a number of players come to mind. I mean, Bernie Federico, of course, hall of famer, um, you know, uh, from his career with the Blues, Bernie just had so much talent. And, and he saw the ice, as many of the great players do. Uh, they don't see it just in their own lane. They almost see it like a, 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 a God's eye camera from above. They know where he always knew. Brian always knew where his, uh, where his wingers were. And, and, you know, whether it was Sutter or Babich or, or, uh, or, or whomever. 
Um, you know, and he just, uh, he had a knack for putting the puck where they were going. Gretzky did that all the time too, or did that as a defenseman. Um, you know, I think the greatest player um, that I had the privilege to play against was Bobby Orr. Um, you know, I only played one season against him, but um, I mean, the man was magic. Um, and and he, he just uh, could do it all. Gretzky, of course, I mean, there, there's, there's a, a, a whole litany of players, you know, many players had, had skills, uh, you know, Bork could really move the puck up the ice, shoot a cannon, both the hulls, you know, Marcel Dion, you, there were so many great players and any player in the league can do so many things, uh, can do a number of things good, but the ones that, that really, really stepped up, uh, a dear friend of mine, Clark Gillies, who went on, who I said made, played junior with, went on, um, uh, you know, four Stanley Cups with the Islanders, captain of the Islanders on a team that was full of leaders, you know. So here's a guy that's the leader of the team out there in Long Island. And, uh, you know, just a, just another wonderful, a, a, a great ambassador for the game and now a Hockey Hall of Famer. He always impressed me, you know, the way he played uh, the gentle giant, you know. He'd leave him alone and he'd score goals. Don't leave him alone. He's going to beat you up. <laughs> yeah. Um. That goes my tongue. I'm just, I'm, I'm in awe. I love hearing the stories of all of that. Um, do you remember the first person to score on you? Yeah, uh, it would have been uh, uh, in, in Toronto, that first game. And I think it was Boreas Salming, actually, um, if I remember correctly. Um, and, uh, yeah, they had a pretty good hockey club, and, and uh, they, they were in their home ice. And it was Saturday, they were always tough to beat on Saturday night because that was hockey night in Canada up in, up in this neck of the woods. But you know what? I'd have to, have to see if I could uh, look at the score sheet. But I, 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 I think it was uh, – it might have been Salming or Hammerstrom. Uh, and, again, Ingy Hammerstrom came and played with us in St. Louis, and, and he, uh, he lived with me for a little while when he first got traded there. Uh, he needed a place to stay, so he stayed with me. And, um, yeah, we talked about that first game a couple of times. Oh, that's uh, cool. Do you remember the last person to score against you? Yes, it was in uh, Madison Square Gardens. I don't remember who scored it, but it was in Madison Square Gardens against the Rangers, yeah. Um, now, in your career, you played with the Blues for six years. Um, you got to play, and, and you mentioned a couple. You got Glenn Hall as a coach. Jacques Plant was there. And you have a connection to Jacques Plant that I have to bring up. Doc was the first one to wear a goalie mask. And you might be, and I'm, I, we talked a little bit on the South Line, you might be the first blue to have put painting on your mask. How did I, that come I, about? Well, it, it was during the time in the, in the 70s there where goaltenders, uh, Rutherford for Detroit, uh, you know, Palmateer for Toronto, myself in St. Louis, and other goaltenders were starting to do that. Uh, and... And um, I remember when, when we came up with the idea to put uh, the blue notes on around the eye, well, technically one of the blue notes is reversed, obviously. If, if you know, we all know that the blue note, if you look at your sweater, it, the way it goes, the one above the, the other eye, uh, the, one, the one that would be correct would be the one on the left eye and the one on the right eye would be the one that would be arguably reversed. And I remember Sid Solomon uh, III, the owner of the team, uh, the first game I wore it, he didn't know that I was going to wear this mask with the blue notes on it. And of course, he lived and died and loved the blue note himself. And um, and he had a problem with it. He said, one of those is backwards. We got to figure out how to maybe change this. But he acquiesced and he said, uh, after we talked about it, uh, I said, you know, it's it's. Uh, I'll obviously do whatever's asked of me. I said, but know that I'm doing this respectfully and it's for the team. And uh, And he said, yeah, he said, you let it go. Yeah, so you ended up doing just the one note over your eye. It, I love that mask. I love it. Now, I asked you if you had that mask, and, and you don't. But can you tell the story about that mask? I think it's really cool. Yeah. Um, well, it's funny because that mask, I got traded to Winnipeg uh, in uh, 80, or sorry, uh, uh, 81, and, um, and it got repainted uh, up there into the Jets colors. And then I went to a different uh, style of mask and that, and that mask uh, basically was sitting on the shelf until my career ended. Uh, when my career ended, it got sent back to the, the fellow in Toronto who had, who had made it. 
and and um, and I had it repainted. And the reason in the original blues color, and the reason for that was the Hockey Hall of Fame, which has a tremendous collection. If any of, of the fans uh, get to Toronto, you got to go to the Hockey Hall of Fame and see the goaltenders' mask collection because it's brilliant. There's about well, twenty or thirty masks in there that are just. Beautiful. Anyway, so long and short of it, I sent the mask to get repainted so they could go to the Hall of Fame, but it disappeared. Somehow it, it, it never got back to me. And then um, about 20 years after I'd retired, uh, and, um, I, I got a call from a, a collector of masks. He lives in Florida. And he said, I believe I've got access to your blues mask. And he said to me, um, he said, I, I'm going to buy it, he said, and I, he says, can you tell me something about it so that I'd know uh, that it is, in fact, the real mask? And I told him a couple of things. I said, one, it was repainted uh, poorly when I was in Winnipeg, and a big streak of blue paint rolled into the inside of the eye and ran down the inside. So it almost looks like a tear on the inside of the mask that only when you put it on, you'd see. And he says, that appears to be here. And he said, I said, there's one other mark. He said, I said, it's on the forehead where Dennis Hall hit me in the head once. And I said, I, I know there's a dent and a crack there. And he said, uh, he said, it looks like it. Anyways, he mailed it to me. I looked at the mask. It was definitely the mask. I sent it back to him. And he said, you're welcome to have the mask because it's technically yours. It disappeared on you. He said, where you said, I said, well, you know what? I'd like you to keep it because you went through the throes of finding it. Uh, he said, well, what can I do for you? Well, at the time I was in the military, the Canadian military, and I had served overseas uh, with some, uh, some great young American soldiers and sailors and airmen and women. And, um, and I said, well, I'd like you to make a donation to uh, the Wounded Warrior and Soldier On programs. And he did. So he kept the mask. It's in a collection down in Florida right now. And um, this, uh, this gentleman was very kind, and he made a significant donation to, uh, to our uh, veterans. Uh, our ill and injured veterans. Well, that that's cool, and and I'm bringing me to my ne my next question. And we talk about we come. You just brought it up. So at the age of 29, your career is winding down. You're in uh, Hartford, and you decide. I, I mean, at 29, I was 11 years into my career already, <laughs> right? Um, you decide to give it all up, join the Canadian Armed Forces. I got to know what, what goes into that decision? Well, my, my father and my mother were both veterans of the second world war and they had immigrated to Canada from Europe at the end of the war. And um, they were very, very proud Canadians with, uh, with roots back to Europe. And uh, they were very patriotic and very loyal. Um, they, they realized uh, um, that the world was a much better place because Nations like Canada and, and America and Britain had stepped up and, and uh, paid a terrible price uh, to right some wrongs that were going on in the world at the time. So anyways, that always resonated with me. My father instilled that with me. My mother instilled that with me. And uh, so after leaving the game, it was less, just less than a year after I left the game, I started thinking about what I was going to do. Because as you noted, I, in one sense, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, I'm not, not exactly, a, uh, you know, the youngest recruit when I went into the Canadian Armed Forces. Um, by the time I was almost finished my basic training, I was in my 30s. And uh, a true story, by the way, I can remember standing on a parade square as a, a new officer cadet, uh, 30 years old. It was just a little, little over a year since I played my last game in the NHL in Madison Square Garden. And about, about a 25, 26 year old sergeant is giving me rifle drill and he's just hollering at me, he's screaming at me. He says, Stanowski, you're the most uncoordinated thing I've ever seen in my life. Of course, I was going to say to him, oh, you saw my last game, eh? But, uh, <laughs> but I, I just kept my mouth shut and I did what I was uh, told and what was expected of me. I got through my basic training and, and I'd like to think that I never looked back. And I had 29 years, uh, almost three times uh, the, the time I had in the National Hockey League I, I had in the Canadian Armed Forces. And uh, uh, Guy and Brock, I, I can tell you that I was very, very fortunate um, to travel all over the world and serve with some great young Canadian men and women and some outstanding American men and women. And I saw uh, self-sacrifice and I saw uh, character and I saw loyalty, uh, brotherhood and sisterhood that uh, 
that only compared to what I saw in hockey, I can tell you. Uh, the consequence and the, and the outcomes were much more dire than in a, in a hockey game. But the, uh, the closeness, the camaraderie, camaraderie that one gets in the military um, is every bit as close and every bit as, uh, as real as what uh, I experienced in the National Hockey League. Well, we definitely thank you for your service. Guys, a, a veteran, as you mentioned, I'm a veteran of the Army. I uh, spent some time in Europe myself. So, again, we thank you um, for, for what we're all doing. We're doing what we, we, we were called to do to support our nation. So, again, thank you for your service. Yeah, as a sidebar to that, you know, it's funny. Uh, I, I always – I said um, after I had got some, uh, several years under my belt in the military, I saw – I always said if – if uh, if you could take a, um, a a a soldier and give him the skill and teach him how to skate, um, you could probably have a pretty good hockey player. And if you took a pretty good hockey player, certainly the caliber in the NHL, you could probably turn him into a pretty darn good soldier. Because there's a lot of things that are very very comparable. Um, you know, the teamwork, the effort, the dedication, the focus, uh, the self sacrifice all of those things that make a good soldier, um, all those same things are required to be a successful hockey player at the National Hockey League level. That was my experience anyways. I, I've actually said the exact same thing. I said it was kind of reason why I gravitated towards hockey because I had that military, I, like my grandfather served in World War II. My uncle was in the Navy during Vietnam. My, my stepfather, who I call my father, was in the um, Marines during Vietnam. So all I knew was military. And I love the coordination of a hockey game. Um, when you watch it, never feel like it's a discombobulated mess. You always see, the, because, you know, if you're a new fan, and I've heard new fans say this, it looks, I, I don't understand why, it, you know, everyone's all over the place. And, that, and I said, you have to see the beauty of it. You have to look back at watch, watch the play develop. Sit back, listen to the, what you're hearing in your ears, listen to the names being called, watch what's going on, and the teamwork that has to happen for a goal. And I've said this uh, so many times, 80% of your goals actually start neutral zone. Yeah. As a goaltender, what are you looking for during the rush? Well, uh, the, first, the first observation I would uh, – uh, or comment I would offer is that the game was a lot different back in the seventies and eighties and, and nineties before they opened up the center ice. Um, the, the game through the neutral zone was not as freewheeling and as fast as it is now. Now that you've got the, uh, the, uh, the neutral zone between the two blue lines opened up center ice, two line passes gone. Um, you still have the offside of course at the blue line, but Players are usually uh, coming through the neutral zone now much, much faster than they did back in the day. And the defense could stand up more readily, and guys like Bobby and Barkley could, could use their hips if the young players hit the blue line at full speed and um, try to do something fancy with the puck. Uh, sometimes, as we discussed, you, they'd pay the price. Now you've got the players hitting that blue line with a lot of speed, and the plays develop really, really fast. And I know just playing um, alumni games in the last 10 or years or so, or 15 years, um, you know, some of the newer players have just come out of the game. Wow. They just own that neutral zone. And um, I'm not sure that the skill level is, um, I'm not sure that the skill level is, is a whole lot um, um, better than it was uh, back in the day when I played skill was skill then and skill is skill now. But, um, but uh, you know, the passing, receiving, passing the accurate shooters um, are, are, you know, are still there. The pucks might be shot a little bit harder now because of the sticks, the composite sticks. But um, the, 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 the athletes in the game now are really athletes. They can skate like the wind. And, um, you know, and, and that, it's a skating game now more than anything. Go ahead, Brock. Hey, Brock, we well, I wanted to ask you again, sorry. Um, <laughs> You know, we, a lot of our fans are really old school type and they have such an affinity for the arena and the barn and those Blues Blackhawks games. And just wondering if you could kind of take us through what was it like on a Saturday night to take the ice in St. Louis in the barn with the place rocking? Had to be a, a real thrill. 
uh, the arena was a brilliant place to play. I mean, it was, it was iconic. Um, and, and, uh, I don't think any of us that, that played a single game in the, in the old, uh, arena, um, you know, didn't shed a tear when we, when we heard that a, the team was moving out of there, which they have to do sooner or later. And then when it was demolished, it was even worse. But, but, uh, but that being said, yeah, you'd go in there in the atmosphere, the crowd, um, you know, the, the coming out of the dressing room and as you went down the, the alley out to the ice and you knew as soon as the first player, whether it was myself or Eddie Johnson, whoever, uh, was about to step on the ice, Mike Leut, and that organ had kick in and the crowd would start singing when the Saints come marching in. Um, it, I mean, the hair on the back of your neck would stand up. And if you didn't get excited about playing for the Blues in St. Louis – and if you didn't get a little bit worried if you were the opposition playing against the Blues in the arena, then, man, you probably weren't human, you know, because, because, uh, because it was a pretty exciting, uh, pretty exciting Saturday night. That's for sure. Oh, in the Blues, go marching in. <laughs> oh, in the Blues, go marching in. Oh, you know I want to be in that number when the blues go marching in. I remember every moment of it. I still get chills thinking. Yep. Of, I have it now. I, my arms, just you talking about it. That's why I had to do that for you. You had to hear my horrible singing. But, <laughs> well, just building. the Blues Blackhawks, the Blues Red Wings. I mean, you guys had some great rivalries back in the 70s that really just fill the buildings. I mean, you know, going up to Detroit had to be a, a real treat for you guys going to Minnesota, playing the North stars. So you guys had your hands full back then. Oh, well, it's for sure. And, and I mean, the, 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 the quality of players uh, on all those teams, I mean, you had to, you had to bring your ATA game, you know, wherever you played, whenever you played or, or, or you'd pay the price, um, you know, going into Chicago and to uh, into the stadium there was not an easy game either, you know, and you're right. Uh, my first year in St. Louis, we played in the old Olympia in Detroit when we went into Detroit and there were no corners there. I mean, I think, I think the board started tapering around center ice and, and then went around behind the net. And, uh, you know, these were, these were the ice palaces that uh, Gordy Howe and, you know, and, and Detroit and, and Bobby Hull in Chicago and, you know, and Keon and the like up in Toronto and, you know, and, and, you know, you when you went in there, you could feel the presence. There was ghosts in those buildings that uh, that uh, you had to pay homage to. And if you stole a couple points coming out of those buildings, you had earned it. You knew you had earned it. Oh yeah, I, I saw. I actually saw the very last game played at the United Center. Uh, ah. It was a one to nothing loss from the Black uh, to Blackhawks to Toronto. I was happy, but. Uh, yeah, I had just come back from Japan. I'd been in Japan for three years, uh, came back in 94, and took my wife to her first ever hockey game, and it was a Blackhawks game. <laughs> they, talking, about, uh, talking about hair on the back of your neck, there's another arena that had an organist that would, uh, when he hit those, when those pipes uh, started to go, especially around Christmas time, he'd play the Christmas carols in the pregame warm-up. And uh, I remember that, and it was pretty exciting. Uh, not only could you, were you excited about playing the game, but you knew Christmas was near. Right. So um, you said earlier you get back to St. Louis about three times, three four times a year when, when pre-COVID and that, and hopefully post-COVID that can come back. What are some of your favorite memories of being in St. Louis, um, or even coming back when you've come back? What are some of your favorite memories? Oh, I, I, I have so many of them. First and foremost, the people, uh, you know, and and again. Everyone that I met associated with the game of hockey there, whether it was uh, the fans first and foremost, um, you know, the, 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 the staff at the arena, the staff at the front office with the Blues organization, the management, I mean, they were all just so good to me personally and, and to my, uh, my teammates, I, you know, uh, and that's just a thrill. Um, the city itself, um, I, I, like most of the players, I lived in the West County. Uh, when I was there for for most of my time, but I did live one year right at the waterfront. I was I was about a about a pitching wedge uh, away from the arch, actually, in a condominium, a high rise condominium downtown, and I absolutely loved it. Um, you know, so uh, the, the the whole the whole uh, nightlife and and uh, is that the mansion the, house. 
Was, was that I'm the sorry? mansion house? That, was that the yeah. mansion house? Yeah. yeah that's, that's where all the athletes lived. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, um, and it was, uh, it, you know, the, re the restaurants. I love the Southern cuisine. And I love I loved jazz. I love the, I love the uh, establishments that have good jazz music. Uh, you know, uh, I, there was just so many things there that, uh, that a young hockey player, especially when a person's single, you know, uh, I was single for all six of my years in St. Louis and it just, the, you know, the, um, the restaurants and the nightlife and, and, uh, you know, it's an easy city to get around. It's really well designed and, uh, you know, the freeways and, and the like, everything about the city, the culture. I mean, there's so much history there you know, Bush Gardens and, and uh, again, the arch itself and, and uh, you know, some of the other things that are, there are to do there. It's, it, I, I was very tempted to move back and live there. Uh, had I not joined the military, uh, the Canadian military, I probably would have ended up living in St. Louis. Yeah, that's, um, St. Louis has probably got the most ex or former NHL players in any city in North America. But we're almost out of time, and I want to get into this because this is how I ended up connecting to you. I know that you're a very strong man of faith and um, were you a man of faith uh, all through your career? Or was it something you came to later in life? Uh, what brought you to that? And can you talk a little bit about what you're doing now with that? Well, I, I, I again, I think my faith would orig originated with, uh, from my parents. And again, my father had served in the infantry in the second world war and he fought through some of the most terrible battles in Southern Europe. Um, he was in the Polish army. Um, and, and in, um, in 1939, when the war started, September 1st, my father was in the Polish infantry uh, on day one of the fighting, and he was still in the infantry um, in 1945 when the war ended. And he had, um, uh, he had suffered several wounds and, um, and uh, had seen, you know, the, some of the worst fighting there. And he, he said to me, um, he said to me, Ed, there's no such thing as an atheist in a foxhole when the bullets are flying. And, and uh, he's absolutely correct. You know, um, I'd been brought up in a home where, where we had a very strong faith and a belief, a very strong mother, uh, very strong Christian values and ethics. And um, when I got to St. Louis, uh, we had chapel studies every Saturday, or sorry, every Sunday morning in uh, pregame on the road, uh, led by Eddie Kia. And you might remember Eddie was a big, strong, stout defenseman and tragically was injured uh, uh, during a stint in the minors. And, and, and we lost Eddie a couple of years, um, you know, after that. Um, but, but we used to have very strong um, uh, Bible studies and, and chapel services uh, by team members in the Blues team. And that was great. Uh, uh, and it just, uh, it just solidified a, a number of us as, as good friends. Um, and then, then for myself, I became very involved with Hockey Ministries International, which is a, a, a Christian organization that has spent a lot of time um, um, doing hockey skills for young hockey players literally all over the world. And, um, and it's, it's been a real exciting and a lot of fun to work with them. And there's a lot of NHL players, uh, you know, that have, have worked with HMI uh, all over the world, uh, quite frankly, uh, for, for going on 40, 50 years now. Um, so, and again, you know, uh, my experience in the military being overseas in the Middle East, Afghanistan, Africa, and, uh, uh, the Balkans just strengthened my faith. Um, you know, I was certainly challenged at times, but it certainly strengthened my faith. And, and when, when I, uh, my, with my father's passing and that older brother I talked about who was in the military with his passing, and then now the loss of my daughter. Uh, you know, I have a, um, a hope and an assurance that, uh, that, that what we experience here in life, while as important as it is, and, and, and we have much to do that, um, you know, in Christ we can have um, eternity and we can have uh, the assurance that we'll be with those we love again. Uh, uh, that's a, a great, great thought. It's actually a, a great point to end on. I, normally, see, you already answered my last question. Normally, my last question is, did you feel like the Family Cup win in 19 was, for, was part of yours? You kind of already answered that. Um, so give us a little bit about what that meant, them winning that cup. Well, I, for me, as much as I felt connected to the fans that probably are, are, the, are the team, the players on the team that I know, um, 
and 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 the management people in the management that I know and the alumni that were there, I was most happy for the fans. Uh, you know, the fans in St. Louis have stayed with that team for uh, you know years and years and years. Some of them, and I mean, look at yourselves. You guys, uh, you guys know uh, have the insight that only comes from being a loyal fans. And I know a lot of your listeners would fall in those, that same category. And I was really happy for, for, the, uh, for the fans of St. Louis, for the city itself. I mean, I'm, there were people who probably weren't Blues fans that, uh, you know, were just thrilled to see that cup come to St. Louis. And, and um, you know, I had the privilege while I was in the forces, in the Canadian Armed Forces, to take the Stanley Cup to Afghanistan on a visit to the troops. I was asked by the Canadian uh, 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 um, uh, chief of defense staff, if, if, uh, if I could contact the, um, the uh, president of the league, uh, Mr. Bettman, and, and see if he would allow the Stanley Cup to go to Afghanistan. At the time, it was the only professional trophy that had, quote unquote, gone to war. Yeah. And uh, it was a big, uh, big event. The troops absolutely loved it. And, and only, uh, only hockey fans would deploy to Afghanistan where it's 105 to 135 degrees every day. And they'd take their hockey sweaters and play ball hockey. There was no ice over there, but there were hockey rinks, believe it or not, on almost every Ford operating base fob over there. And there was always ball hockey being played. And when, that, when the NHL guys that went over showed up with the Stanley Cup, whether they were young Canadians or young American service members, who were working you know, serving serving over there? They they found time to get close to the cup, touch it, get a picture taken with their uh, with their hockey favorite hockey jersey on. And I got to tell you, there were a lot of blue sweaters over there. Uh, I, I I know I wore my jersey all the time. I mean, well, thank you for uh, doing that because those yeah. soldiers deserve that, and that's that's I'm glad that you remembered them. Well, it was exciting. It was exciting. It was neat to see. It was neat to see. A uh, true true story. Uh, we we're getting a picture taken with the cup uh, on the front of an armored personnel carrier over there, a lav. And, um, and uh, there had just been a rocket attack not too long before that. And the troops all came back out to continue getting their pictures taken. We had it all dispersed and we came back and we we're getting our pictures taken again. And one of the young, one of the young uh, uh, players had a Toronto Maple Leafs jersey on it. And he said, this is a year for the Leafs. The Leafs are going to win it all this year. One of the players down the line said, you got to be kidding. The Taliban got a better chance of winning the cup than the Leafs. <laughs> That's good. Oh, and what a way to end this. Brock, any last words? No, just thanks. We always appreciate you guys spending time with us and the fans. Again, uh, so many memories, and you guys resonate with so many people in so many different ways. So thanks for taking time. A yeah. final word from a final word for me, if I could, uh, 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 Gabe Brock, and that, and that's to to my uh, to the dear fans in St. Louis. You're the best. You know, stay behind the team, stick with it. Um, I, I I know I know that 19 was a special season. Uh, 20, well, there's a whole bunch of things that, that were distractions. Let's see if we can't pull it off in 21 and beyond. Uh, God love you. We'll see you back in St. Louis. Oh, we love it, and um, I'm hoping to get back. I, I, my kind of plan, I'm kind of looking at if I can make this happen, getting back for the next fantasy camp. Um, and, and man, if I do, I hope that you're one of the guys that gets to come for that. Cause I, I mean, I'm going to go <laughs> ballistic if that happened. I got well, a couch. You guys can stay in my basement. I got a couch. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ed, thank you so much for, for spending some time with us. Um, I, I know I'll get to talk to you some more. Uh, um, I'm hoping that I get invited back to the, the group that, that I met you in. Um, now, be, to be 100% honest, I'm not a, of Christian faith. I have a different faith, but I have strong faith e e e at that. And you guys really inspired me with my, to get stronger in my faith, listening to all the stories and listening to you gentlemen. And, and it really, it, it, it's very impressive that you guys continue to uh, lift up, not just the players, but the fans, because your time, the time that you give them is, is so precious. Uh, we did a show yesterday and Mike Zook jumped on and you could just, all of a sudden people are just throwing questions. They love it. So again, I just say thank you so much for joining me and Brock on the Blue Note Fan Report. My pleasure, guys. You take care.
Okay, so to everyone, this is Guy the Hawaii Blues fan saying, Brock and Ed, you got to know that I'm bleeding blue at you, and I cannot wait to see you on the next Blue No Fan Report. Aloha, mahalo, and I'm bleeding blue with you.